Brother Ricky's sermon, one point. Like, it's like, and Brother Dave, did you catch this? Brother Dave did not have points. Brother Dave had four movements and five moments. Jason, tell me what, what that means. Well, I do not have as much as Brother Dave had. And I pray that I do not have less than Brother Rick had. <laughs> but I sincerely appreciate being here. When Brother Mike sent me the email this earlier this year, and asked me to pick a topic, I thought this must be one of these computer viruses I've received. <laughs> Something's mixed up, because I will tell you that I had never uh, envisioned, and I know we all have our own little fantasies in certain ways, even in the spiritual realm, and I never thought that I would be asked to speak. And this is a great joy, and I give all the glory to God. I would like to begin tonight by giving thanks to the Father and the Son and for the Holy Spirit who has provided for us fellowship with the Godhead. His presence, though not seen, is sensed by our spirits. And what a glory it is to have this blessed assurance based not upon physical things, but upon something that is eternal. Not really understood by mere feelings, but by the inner man, that part of us that has been recreated by the power of God. This is a glorious thing. And I know that in certain circles, this, what I'm going to say, wouldn't be appreciated. But this fellowship is agreed upon in heaven by the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we receive this testimony on earth. And it is agreed upon by the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in one. And all of that is scripture. I am convinced that Jesus being sinless through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. And since Jesus is the pioneer and captain of the faith, the faith that has once for all been delivered to the saints, it behooves us to follow that example. The example that He set for us, which is on a path of righteousness, it is the highway of holiness. But in my mind, I have to ask this question, how is that possible? When I look at the life of Jesus, how is it possible for me, knowing my background and my old nature, to accomplish that? Since Jesus coming into this world, to accomplish the Father's will, and not His own, walked all of the days of His ministry in a manner that was led by the Holy Spirit who had descended upon Him and remained upon Him unto His death. We too who have been called of God more assuredly need that abiding presence of the Spirit. Amen. If we're going to be faithful unto death, whether or not we are to be obedient is not the question. The point is that since Jesus in his state of perfection still needed to utilize the power of the Holy Spirit for his obedience, we also need to. And that point was worth making twice. Amen. Yeah. Now, brethren, you are sanctified in Christ Jesus and you are called to be saints. Bear this fact in mind. This is the way it is. You are not trying to be sanctified. You are not trying to be saints. You are. I stood in an elevator one day next to a man, and I didn't know it, but he was of a persuasion which has a different outlook on saints than we do. All theirs are elected after their death, not while they're alive. And he said, how are you doing? And I said, well, I'm a saint. He said, already? I said, absolutely. He said, you've been canonized? I said, amen. I said, I said there was an election. It was unanimous. I am. I am convinced tonight, especially after the words I've received, that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit.
Spirit of God. They are foolishness to Him. He cannot know them. They are spiritually discerned. Without the Spirit, nothing of the spiritual nature is discernible. And I am convinced that I am in the midst of brothers and sisters that are not natural men and women, but they are brothers and sisters of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, children of the Father, and partakers of the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced of this. My text tonight is 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to be reading the first two verses, although my message is not an exposition, brother. It is just a glimpse at the work of the Spirit. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, the NIV said, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. I would like to make three quick statements of which I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed to admit that my salvation is according to the foreknowledge of God and it was not my idea. I am not ashamed to admit that the sum total of my holiness is due to the fact that the Spirit of God dwells in me. I am not ashamed to admit that God's Spirit within me compels me to be obedient, for as I am in the flesh, I am unable to toe the mark. And He gets all of the glory. The Spirit keeps me constantly aware of the fact that the blood poured out by Jesus was sprinkled to cleanse me from sin. Now concerning the topic, the role of the Holy Spirit in my obedience to Truth. I want us to see that the role of the Holy Spirit is a role unlike man's concept of role playing. Amen. We have a very limited concept of this. Book of Acts, chapter 17. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the Godhead, that it is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art. Not the way God is. He is not an idol. Neither is man fully able to understand the way God works in a manner that can be explained in a mechanical, a logical, a biological, a biological, a mystical, or a philosophical way. God is the spirit. God communicates with man's spirit, and man's spirit can only communicate with God. This is the way it works. Now, while we do have an insight into the divine nature being represented to us in, in three terms. And brothers, I want to confess to you that I still am not comfortable with the word Trinity. I'm just not comfortable with it. I believe in the Father, I believe in the Son, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, and I believe that they are three distinct, and I believe they are one, but for some reason, don't ask me why, I'm just not comfortable. We cannot say that one thing or another is each one's exclusive role. God is not divided into parts like that. And to depend upon one facet of the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit as being respective and exclusive to their identity is to be very weak in our understanding of Him. If a person suggests that they know God in a physical way or in a mental way, that person is extremely short-sighted. The nature of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is revealed in more than just words and more than just concepts. There are two key words. There are faith and obedience, and they are almost married in the Greek, although they are distinct. The faith and obedience and the great and precious promises which were alluded to earlier are given to us in Scripture so that we might participate in the divine nature now, the Holy Spirit declares that participation in the divine nature through these great and precious promises prevents us from being unfruitful in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is essential to your obedience. How can you Amen. obey Him whom you have not known? Yes. The Spirit has been known, I want you to see, in creation. I want you to catch this first one because nobody used this verse. I think it's the only one. But nobody found this one. There are, to begin with, evidences of the Holy Spirit and His involvement with creation. 
beginning with the Old Testament. And I know that many people don't believe this. I was really not taught too much in this area. Just last week, an elder in a local church told me that they were studying the Holy Spirit. And he says, of course, you know, the Old Testament has very little to say regarding the Holy Spirit. I, I, I did not rebuke him. I treated him as a father and I corrected him. Offered him my notes, Sister June, on my introduction to 16 pages. He wasn't interested. But anyway, Genesis chapter 1, it says that the Spirit of God was, was hovering over the waters in creation. You see, in the beginning, He was present and positioned for involvement in creation. And He, he had, He still has, and when I look at the book of Revelation and see the Spirit before the throne, He forever will have the best seat in the house to observe what's going on and to interact. He's got it. Always been there. Always will be. The Lord even said in Genesis chapter 6, My spirit's not going to contend with man forever. He was interactive with man in those days. Even the pagan world testified in Genesis chapter 41 where Pharaoh asked, Can we find one in whom the Spirit of God is? The world knows. The world sees they don't know in the sense we know. But they know there's something there that they don't have. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, we understand, moved the prophets to obedience. Now I want us to focus tonight on the action words regarding the Spirit. We're talking about obedience. Obedience is not separate from action. Notice the Spirit's role. Peter, in his second epistle in chapter 1, regarding prophecy, said prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried. Notice that action. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, the text that I chose in verses 10 through 12, we see that the prophet spoke of the grace that was to come and they searched intently regarding this. They were trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, by the way it says, who was in them, was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. Now the Holy Spirit was pointing and predicting. He was, in the King James Version, signifying. A clear and certain manifestation to them. This was not some prognostication based upon signs of the creation or conclusions reached by logical assumptions. Holy Spirit was showing, pointing, telling, revealing what was there. I've often been told that the when the prophets saw these things that they were able to, that the Lord uncovered before them for them to see. I kind of like it as more of a private uncovering in that God, through His Spirit, allowed them to look under the cover. Didn't reveal it to anybody else, you see. Allowed them to look the top secret files to see certain elements of God's manifold plan. Now, unless this revealing was performed by the Holy Spirit, and that's the action taking place for their obedience, the revealing, these men would not have been prophets. This is essentially the difference between them and other people. Men whom the Spirit has not allowed to see inside are merely guessers and liars. But these men were different. There are many examples of the movement of the Holy Spirit concerning God's people in the Old Testament. Many. In the book of Exodus, as Brother Tim spoke of today, Bezalel filled him with the Spirit in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in workmanship. And Brother Tim talked about what he did. But I want you to see that he filled him with this so that he might finish this good work of God. And I want you to see that God filled his son 
with this same spirit that Jesus on the cross might also say it is finished. And that only by that spirit within you, that same spirit, can you finish this race, as Paul said. Amen. This is it. It's a finishing thing. This is not a starting. This is a real work. Even Saul in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 11. This is an unusual one. And I'm thankful that the Spirit of God doesn't come across me like this very often. But he did and it was necessary in that day. It says that the Spirit of God came upon Saul in power and he burned with anger and he took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel proclaiming, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people and they turned out as one man. I want you to really test that spirit, brothers, if you feel moved to do that type of thing. In Ezekiel, of course, we remember God said, I'm going to put my spirit in you and you will live. But there is a real action. In Ezekiel chapter 11, beginning there in verse 24, the spirit lifted Ezekiel. It lifted him to obedience. He says the spirit lifted me up, brought me to the exiles in Babylon. Later in verse 25, he says, uh, pack your belongings for exile. And in the daytime, as they watch, set out, go from where you are to another place. Perhaps they will understand. Go out like those who go into exile. So do you know what Ezekiel did? He says, so I did as I was commanded, only by the Holy Spirit. And he knew that apparently foolish thing before the people. And then the Lord said, Say to them, I'm assigned to you as I have done it, so it will be done to you. They will go into exile as captives. They will know that I am the Lord. Sometimes I think that our obedience may only be that the world may know that our Lord is God. Just, just that simple thing. But this was accomplished only by the obedience of a man whom the Spirit had lifted. Our lives are not so different. And I would encourage you this day, pack your bags, show the world what God's going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Book of Haggai, second chapter. A very comforting thought in here regarding the Spirit. And a lot of people don't think that God's very comforting in the Old Testament. But He is. My Spirit remains on you. Do not fear, even though I shake the nations. that the Spirit was remaining upon the people of God so that His shaking of the world would not alarm them. And even for us today, in the Spirit's abiding presence, we are not shaken, though we are aware that the natural order of things is passing away. What a comfort that is. Amen. Zechariah chapter 4 is where the word is given, not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit. Not your natural ability. I am a living testimony of this. I am thankful for all of the things of life that God has created. I do not boast and I do not commend men to ignorance, but I say in humility that I graduated 56 out of a class of 125 in high school. My IQ is not so impressive. But I will tell you that my SQ, my spirit quotient, is at the gifted level. <laughs> now it was revealed in the Gospel of Luke to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ, and he was moved by the Spirit. And the Spirit still moved right down through the ages. Yeah. Now since God was able to move those men, of the Old Covenant, to righteous works by His Spirit, how much more is He able to do exceedingly abundantly, above more than we can even ask or think, Amen. according to the power that works within us. Amen. This is a great thing. Now concerning Jesus, 
Jesus obeyed the Spirit. The Spirit and obedience had a divine, a special purpose with Jesus. These are not trinkets. He was not called here to build furniture. He was called to lay a foundation. And it says that Jesus, through the spirit of holiness, was declared with power to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. Through the spirit. In the Gospel of Mark, after Jesus' baptism, after the epiphany, when it is announced, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. <laughs> Immediately the Spirit drove him, compelled him into the wilderness. Luke records he was led by the Spirit. Jesus taught us to obey the Spirit. If you love me, you will obey what I command. I will ask the Father. He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He was being, he was teaching that. When the counselor comes, he says in John 15, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out before me from the Father, he will testify about me. And he said, I have much more to say, more than you can now bear. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. You see, this is key because the Spirit expressly warned that in the latter days, some would follow seducing spirits and not faith. And I am so glad that the Spirit's ministry has not ended. Amen. Now, concerning the apostles' instruction to us regarding obedience and the truth of the Holy Spirit, His role. From the onset of their ministry at the departure of Jesus, they were commanded to do more than to make disciples and baptize. They were commanded to teach everything that they had taught. Now, somewhere through the grand process of discipleship, which is grand, some people forgot to continue teaching what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. I'm glad that in this fellowship that God's Spirit has moved to continue that teaching. We are reminded in 1 John chapter 3, and of those who obey His commands, now that should be us, live in Him. And he in them. And this is how we know it. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. Paul had this understanding concerning his own ministry, of which he could not boast, brothers and sisters. He could not. My message, my preaching were not with lies and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but upon God's power. He knew that. And then he asked a thought-provoking question in Philippians chapter 2, where he says, if you have any fellowship with the Spirit, do you have fellowship with the Spirit? I believe so. For He anointed us, set His seal of ownership on us, Put His Spirit within our hearts, a deposit guaranteeing not just what is, but what is to come. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Oh, there's fellowship there. I'm in fellowship with people that guarantee me things. Acts chapter 16. Paul had a testimony concerning the Spirit that he was obeying, obeying because he had listened to Jesus and he received that instruction, and he explicitly said in Acts chapter 16, he and his companions were being kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia and Bithynia. Now from this they reasoned spiritually and concluded that God had called them to preach in Macedonia, but the Spirit kept them. Also, then he said, now, compelled 
by the Spirit. And I've also, it's been revealed to me by the Holy Spirit warning me that prison and hardships are facing me. And do you know who he said that to? The elders. When was the last time you told your elders the Spirit was compelling you? And the Spirit had warned you? I think that would be a good one to throw out some board meeting. <laughs> now Paul, Paul went to his grave convinced that this law of the Spirit had set him free from the law of sin and death. He had good reason. He had good reason not just because of experience, but because he believed and obeyed the truth. And I personally can see how his faith in God allowed him a closer relationship with the Holy Spirit. A closer fellowship than what most people enjoy, so they say they enjoy, in this life. He knew that we are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. He reminded us that we have an obligation to the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body so that we can live. And he said that those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And in that relationship, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Paul comforted us with these thoughts, but especially with the thought in Romans 8 that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Now, we in this day, still have a responsibility towards the Holy Spirit. This did not close with the book of Revelation. And we receive what I believe is the ministry of the Spirit. Now the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. They're foolishness. Those who have the Spirit receive the ministry of the Spirit. And they cherish those things that the Spirit ministers unto them. And this is the direction where we're going right now. God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. You see the Spirit searching all things, even the deep things of God, is even revealing to us that the Spirit Himself is ministering to us. When I heard in Joplin not too many days ago that brethren and sisters were praying for the speakers here, I was ministered to. And that was through the Spirit. You did not come to know Christ in a worldly way. You heard of Him. You were taught of Him in accordance with the truth. And you have received the ministry of the Spirit. You were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off your old self. To be made new in the attitudes of your mind. To put on the new self. To put off falsehood. To speak truthfully. And that in your anger, which we will have from time to time, do not sin. We were taught, do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold. We were taught, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building up according to their needs. We were taught not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God and to get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all anger, all brawling, all slander, along with every form of malice, and to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ and God forgave you, and to be imitators of God. And this is being taught by the Spirit. Amen. And you know, we don't graduate from that school in this life. Amen. Now you were taught, but you were not taught as a correspondence course by simply reading. You were taught, but you weren't taught just by men who knew the Word. You were taught by the Holy Spirit of God who takes these teachings of Christ, makes them come to light, and drives them home in a manner that they are not just remembered, but they're realized. And they're alive. I believe this is a great part of the sanctifying ministry of the Spirit. I am thankful to God for this part of the ministry. And looking back at my past, I am thankful to God on behalf of my wife who wanted to be here tonight. And my daughter and my son who are here tonight. But the Spirit still works 
in sanctifying me and that that was not a one time work at the time when I was baptized. Amen. I am thankful for me and I am thankful for them and I'm thankful for anybody who comes in contact with me because there have been many rough edges through the years and pits that needed to be filled, Brother Given. And he receives the glory for that. The Spirit works in a way that we can be obedient step by step. I still am amazed at how God could create, Brother Dan, all of creation, put us in here in a physical body, and contact us, so to say, through spiritual means, and yet coordinate all of these things so that our body and our mind and our spirit can function. Although the soul and the body don't function too well spiritually, they can. And I'm amazed that it's even possible. It's just, it's just more than I can contain. But he lets us know the Apostle Paul, Galatians 5, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Some time ago I looked that up, I was reading, I don't know if it was A.T. Robertson or who it was in that phrase. And he mentioned keeping in step, step by step, as in file and rank in marching. That's walking in the Spirit. That's not doing your own thing in the crowd. That's stepping as you step. That is like with your older brother or father or whoever it was who dredging through the deep snow ahead of you walked in a way so that you could put your footprints in their footprints. And he has provided that for us and he desires that of us and he commands that of us and we should do that. Stephen experienced the ministry of of the Holy Spirit and we are encouraged by that testimony even in his death when Stephen before the religious leaders preaching it says that they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke Amen. you've been there haven't you Amen. I am glory to God John was convinced of the spirit's ministry those who obey his commands live in him. I obey him. Why do I obey him? I have been forced by my mother, by my father. It is not a guilt trip that has been placed in my mind. Why is this? This is the way of the Spirit. This is the role of the Spirit in our obedience. Oh, this is a glorious thing. Now, in conclusion of my introduction, <laughs> the mighty presence of the Spirit causes us to have good hope that though the earth and the heavens are shaken, we have no reason to fear. We understand this. And we understand the book of Revelation 22, which says, Come. We understand that. But when we look at the role of the Spirit in our obedience to truth, indeed, His work, the Spirit's work is to help us obey Jesus Christ. To help us obey Him. We need it. Yeah. Now, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yeah. It is impossible to be obedient to the truth and disobedient to Christ. Or by yeah. First of all, obedience is not just a service to God, but it's a participation in the divine nature, as Peter already said. Yeah. He has called us not just out of present darkness, but into eternal life. It may be possible to sum up uh, the work of the Spirit, if you're good, in an English word or a phrase. But my mind stumbles. However, the word sanctified includes a great weight of the work of the Spirit. And I am convinced that His sanctifying work Besides being the revelation of God's foreknowledge, as Peter said, for us is the means by which we are able to offer acceptable worship or obedience to God. That's the means. If it were not for this great role of the Spirit, we would all identify with Isaiah in saying we are all as an unclean thing. All of our 
righteousness are as filthy rags. And we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. If it were not for the Spirit's role in sanctification. But God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He chose you to be saved through this. It could be that much of our obedience to Christ is receiving the ministry of the Holy Spirit. A great deal of it, just receiving it. Now concerning this ministry, we join in it with our participation in the divine nature. His role in our obedience is to empower us to do good and share it. That doesn't sound like scripture, but that is. To do good and share. It sounds almost like something out of the Girl Scout manual, doesn't it? Do good and share. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 16. Check it out. His role in our obedience is empowering us to do good and sharing. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. <laughs> in this ministry, in this obedience to truth, God has made us, put us in a unique place, made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The Spirit gives life. We know that. Now, the Spirit, the ministry of the Spirit is far more glorious than the ministry of the letter. Amen. Far more glorious. Now, one is fading. Fast. But how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? And that's the ministry we're part of. Oh, no, this is getting good. It's getting better now. His ministry of sanctification to us is glorious. We should take special note of it. We should think of the power that is in there in its action more than its definition. So what if you can explain with eloquent words what sanctification is? Is it happening in your life? That's where it counts. Sanctification happened at the time of my baptism into Christ and yours. It's now happening in my walk and your walk in the Spirit. And in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, when this mortal puts on immortality, when the corruptible puts on incorruption, when everything is brought to the fullness, we are going to thank God for sanctification. Yeah. Yeah. Although right now sometimes we, we have difficult times as the Lord straightens us out, knocks off the rough edges, and puts us through some fiery ordeals. I'd like for you to consider the ministry of sanctification, the ministry of the working of the Spirit and our obedience, and I want to give you, and I hope that it's helpful, an illustration of this process. I want you to consider a photo album, any, many photo albums. You have them in your homes. I noticed a brother again looking over wedding photos. I didn't have, I didn't go look at them. I knew by his face what he was looking at. There was no doubt. My grandmother was a very godly woman. I can honestly say that she lived uh, 90 years and I had never heard an evil word come out of her mouth. Oh, I praise God for that woman. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you that she, she was deceived uh, in a way, in a way she wasn't in her life. She, for years, supported uh, a preacher, Jim Swagger. And for years just endorsed her social security checking, mailed it to him. And when he admitted that he had fallen, her only response was, I indeed hope that she finds forgive that he finds forgiveness with the Lord, and the Lord again uses him. Oh man. All of the money she had sent to that man. And that was her only response was for his soul and the ministry of the Lord. Oh, I'm touched. Well, this grandmother had photo albums. I loved to go to her house. Up until probably a month before she died, 
I would go to her house and sit there as a full grown man beside her on the couch as we went through the photo albums of people who I never knew. My father, when he was a child, this was your father, and telling me of things that they experienced and pointing out her faith in God as they lived in this house which my niece fondly referred to as a little dog house. That was their home. I loved those times. My parents had photo albums. And I remember most of the pictures in there, although I was a child, and we had Grand Canyon, uh, birthday parties. And I remember things that happened in our life. Pivotal moments where major things happened where they showed themselves faithful to God. I had a photo album. They have my children in them. A few memories of my father who went to be with the Lord and other pictures. And I look at these things and I consider my own life and I think of it as a photo album, like a snapshot. And now I can look back and I can say, Spirit is sanctifying each one of these times. I have a photo album in my mind which the Lord allows me to recall the working of His Spirit, although at the time I really did not know what was going on. And now as I grow in faith, I get to the point where I have these trials and I say, I don't know what God is going to do, but I know what He is doing. Mm -hmm. That gives me good hope. Yeah. I remember the prophecy of Ezekiel. I will put my spirit in you. I will move you to follow my decrees. Mm -hmm. And be careful to keep my laws. The spirit is still in the action business. He moves me to do it. This is why John says, I know I, I, I obey His commands. Why? Because the Spirit moved Him to do this. He was compelled. And so we get back to some of the references. And here we go. Fourteen facets, Brother Jason, of the Spirit's role in our obedience. I know you needed numbers somehow. Here they are. And you will see some of these things, God working in our life, how He worked in Jesus' life and Paul's life and the prophets' lives. You will see this. He drives us just as He did Jesus to the place where we are fully dependent upon every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen. It may be the selling of your property, the uprooting of your family, the death of loved ones, the false accusations against you because of the name of Christ, but His Spirit's driving you there. Yeah. And He's going to prove you there. Yeah. He's leading us just as we were taught to pray. Not into temptation. It's not where He's leading us, but He's delivering us from evil. And then as Paul told us, He is leading us in triumphal procession in Christ. Yeah. That's where we are. Jesus gives to us the word. He gives it to us not in his own words, but Paul gives it to us concerning him as the word vindication. And as the Spirit leads us, we will be vindicated by truth. We will be on the forefront of God's parade. And we will hold forth the banner as we march on to Zion. He's leading us in this place all the way. He counsels us, number three, in our valley of decision according to His will. So that we might be to the praise of His glory. Not concerned with the trivial things of this life. This is not how He counsels us. The counsel is concerning making a right stand in all of our days, a stand against ungodliness, and a stand for holiness. Amen. 
And then another facet is that he testifies through us that the Father has sent his Son into the world as a Savior so that he never leaves us without words, without purpose, or without power. Yes. Never. Amen. To some, we, when we speak, we are the stench of death. To the others, we are the aroma of life, but we are never without. Yes. And then he guides us with his counsel, just guiding us along. Psalm 73, 24 says, And he guides you with his counsel so that afterward he may receive you into his glory. Amen. So we ought to be comforted by that thought. He's guiding you to get you, oh, I'm just scared. He's guiding you to get you into the right place at the right time to be raptured. I bet you didn't think I'd say that, did you? <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you that the right place is in His Son, and the right time is on the last day. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you glad? <laughs> He's abiding in us now, making His abode with us, not as a visitor, but as Jesus said, He's going to be with you forever. He's our constant mentor. It's a tender place in my heart, as it is in yours, Brother Al, and so many of you here. The day that uh, the Spirit moved me to go to the men's meeting and go up to Brother Gibbon and ask him a question, of which I don't remember the question, Brother Gibbon, but you invited me to come to your home on Friday night. And that's a very sensitive thing to me. And I cherish our times in your home. And I miss the times when we're not. That's the way of this world. I accept that. But that is not the way with the Holy Spirit. Yes. He never leaves. I never have to leave Him. He mentors me all the time because He lives within me. And being in there, He guarantees the inheritance that is to come. With the holy signet of the judge of the living and the dead, impressed upon our hearts, lest we should ever forget whose we are, or where we're going, or with what we were purchased. Yeah. It's like a new birth certificate. Mm -hmm. Stamped not with your mother's fingerprint, but with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think like that. He's fellowshipping with us. Another facet, so that we are assured that we have not been left as orphans, and so that we might be like-minded. I like that. That's what this has been, a testimony of like-mindedness this week. Amen. He burns in us, Sister June, as you have the desire to know more of this issue with the spirit and fire. He burns in us dwelling in us with an intensity such as Jeremiah said, a fire in my bones and I am weary of keeping it in and indeed I cannot hold it in. Desiring. He's desiring and controlling ideas that are concerned with life and peace as the Spirit, who by the way does have a mind of His own impresses his will to us so that even in our will we might be transformed into the image of God. Amen. He desires to sanctify us for participation in deity. He is strengthening in us in our inner man. That is the battleground. That is the trench where the battle is fought. He's strengthening us there. Just as a bodybuilder goes through the process of exerting extra effort, taking the muscle to the point of breaking, and then stopping and relaxing so that then the muscle can mend and be stronger. The Spirit strengthens us by pushing us into righteousness just a little more. A little more. You remember that picture in your life, don't you? It happened several times. And you got stronger as he ministered and comforted you after the pressing. And then when you feel worn out and you're tired, 
he intercedes in accordance with God's will to work his good will toward us because we're called according to his purpose and he does not want us to fail and he wants us to be obedient and he is so precise and careful in his role with us because we are so fragile knowing just how far to take us and then just how to minister to us to build us up and then it seems in these times he's revealing to us the deep things of God's things that he has searched out and made us ready so that we can receive. This shows separation between those who are near to God and those who are far from God. They do not see these things. They have not allowed the Spirit to minister to them. And then in all of this, he is developing an intimacy within us, calling out, Abba, Father. We are led by the Spirit near to the bosom of God. And I'm talking near. This is where the word Abba comes in, the Papa, the, the closeness, the sensitivity of this nature. And when the Spirit gets you this close in the lap of the Father, you look into the apple of his eye and you see you. And he looks into your eye and he sees self. You've been there. Now in conclusion for me. Saints Respond in obedience. We want to do something, don't we? <laughs> Let me do something, God! We want to do something. The subject of our role in obedience, friends, is not near as encompassing as the Spirit's. There's just not as much to our end of it. God has done the major work. I am honored that God even allows me to participate in the process of obedience because I don't deserve it. But He allows me. And I look within the Scripture and I see that He allows me. And I humbly submit to you three responses in obedience to the Spirit regarding His role in our obedience. Three responses and in these we have no glory of ourselves. The first one is in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9. And you can really turn there if you want to. People say, I never give them time. And I never tell them where I'm preaching from. Well, if you know God, you know when I'm saying the Scripture. David says to Solomon, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, you'll be found by him. If you forsake him, he'll cast you off forever. Now in Romans chapter 12, the beginning of that, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so I humbly submit to you today, that if you have a, just an over yearning desire to respond in obedience to the Lord, do it this way with a perfect heart, a willing mind, and a sacrificed body. Yes. Amen. Our salvation is on the highway of holiness, not in the gutters of guile, not in the alleys of adultery. It's where the Spirit leads us, He leads us into obedience. And as I leave you today, I pray that the very God of peace may sanctify you holy. I pray that God, your whole spirit, your whole soul, and your whole body be preserved blameless Amen. until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for the ministry of His Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.